The invention of dynamite by Alfred Nobel in 1867 had a supercharging effect on global industrialization as the world found out firsthand a lot of big problems could be solved with explosives. Though mankind's reliance on being able to blast their issues away has, in hindsight, sometimes gone a little too far. The following is a list of some of the strangest situations where humans have decided the best way to solve a tricky problem was to blow it up. In March 1967, the American supertanker Tory Canyon was stuck on Pollard's Rock off the western coast of Cornwall and leaking oil. For several days, a Dutch salvage team had been trying to repair the damage and pull the ship from the rocks. But as the weather worsened, cracks started appearing on the deck and the operation was called off. As the ship broke apart, UK Prime Minister Harold Wilson and his cabinet held an emergency meeting where it was decided to sink the vessel and burn off the surrounding oil slick to limit the extent of the disaster. Yes, you heard correctly, this was their plan to reduce the impact of this incident. Over the next two days, Royal Navy Buccaneers and Sea Vixens, along with RAF Hunters, dropped 62,000 pounds of bombs, delivered several canisters of napalm, fired 11 rockets, and, get this, dumped over 5,000 liters of jet fuel on the ship. Yes, it seems the only thing they didn't try adding was more crude oil. Though I wouldn't be that surprised if that idea was thrown around during their meetings. Due to the high spring tides, the oil did not burn off as much as hoped. But on March 29th, the ship finally sank. The whole ordeal ended up being a colossal environmental disaster, both due to the bombing and the heavy use of detergent to disperse the oil that actually just caused more damage. The RAF and Royal Navy also suffered some ridicule as their first anti-shipping strike since the end of World War II resulted in 25% of their bombs missing their large stationary target. Despite that embarrassment, interestingly, this event has been commemorated in art, as I was able to find a few paintings of the Torrey Canyon bombing run. But then again, the UK skipped out on Vietnam. So the 60s were kind of a lean time if you were looking to paint British military action. Through the early 1900s, dynamite was also marketed as a tool for farmers, with companies like DuPont pushing for sales by way of booklets literally titled Farming with Dynamite. This text explained how to clear rocks, dumps, dig ditches, and cultivate with explosives, even going so far as to claim dynamite would increase soil fertility. Thus, it's no surprise that when crops were threatened, a farming community might be tempted to see if explosives could solve that problem too. In June 1937, Colorado officials had just 10 days to destroy a biblical plague of locusts before they grew wings and started flying. To do this, a state of emergency was declared and the National Guard was brought in. One of the first surprising tactics employed in this locust war was the use of flamethrowers fired from slow-moving trains. Unfortunately for us, no footage or photographs of this event exist, and I was left to try and make my own artist rendition of what that might have looked like. Yes, there are multiple paintings of the embarrassing Torrey Canyon bombing run, but somehow not one artist has thought the scene of a steam locomotive with flamethrowers battling a swarm of insects would make a great painting. Unbelievable. Unfortunately, the locust death train didn't do much to stop the advance. With the wingless hoppers moving at a rate of about two miles a day, the next plan was of course, explosives. Dynamite was set up across their paths, but unfortunately had little effect besides bouncing them around. Thus, the war was forced to go unconventional, and poison bait was the weapon that finally stopped the plague. In the late 40s, Cayuga County, New York had another kind of infestation that was blackening the skies and whitening the sidewalks. An estimated 400,000 crows inhabited the area, and in March 1949, the residents had finally decided to do something about it. Operation Crow Extermination was created in cooperation between farmers that were tired of their crops being destroyed, and sportsmen worried about the effect crows had on local waterfowl. The plan was to use 500 bombs to blow up 1,000 acres of muckland, where thousands of crows were known to roost nightly. Each bomb would contain a half stick of dynamite surrounded by shards of shrapnel. To get approval for this plan, they agreed to be supervised by the state police, and Cornell University was promised 300 crow carcasses for their research. On March 26, 1949, the bombs were deployed and armed. But they had forgotten one thing. Crows are smart. That afternoon, as the men looked on, the crows started roosting in a different spot, outside the kill zone. Attempts were made to scare the birds back into their usual area with shotguns, but it proved unsuccessful. Once night fell, the decision was made to fire off the explosives, which rattled windows and dishes all over the countryside, but didn't kill a single crow. In the end, the sportsmen had to apologize to Cornell for not delivering the promised dead crows, as well as endure the embarrassment as many local newspapers ran the story. On December 27, 1937, the month-long eruption of the Mauna Loa volcano was threatening the 15,000 inhabitants of the Hawaiian town Hilo, and an unprecedented idea was presented to divert the lava flow. Aerial bombardment. 
In a mission that was planned by then Lieutenant Colonel George S. Patton, the U.S. Army Air Corps 23rd Bombardment Squadron sent five twin-engine biplane bombers with 20 600-pound bombs to attack the volcano. Five of the bombs hit the lava flow directly, while the rest of the bombs struck the solidified lava walls and tubes in an effort to hopefully dam or divert the flow. Seven days later, on January 2nd, the lava flow stopped, and the mission was deemed a success. Though a U.S. geologist, Harold Stearns, who flew with the bombers, was not convinced, calling it most likely a coincidence. Though this didn't stop them from dropping bombs again during the 1942 eruption of the same volcano. The 23rd Bomb Squadron is still active today, flying B-52s out of North Dakota and represented by an insignia one would assume is a reference to the squadron's strange but historic past. But surprisingly, that is also a coincidence, as this volcano and bomb emblem for the squadron was approved in 1931, a full six years before the U.S. Army Air Corps decided to try and bomb a volcano into submission. In a more reasonable battle, air forces in both China and Russia have started fighting ice with fire in recent years. In 2016, two Su-34s launched bombing runs every hour on an ice dam in the Russian Sakona River to prevent it from overflowing its banks. Well, in 2014, the same tactic was used by the Chinese Air Force on ice jams in the Yellow River. While not as exciting, both endeavors have proven to be more successful than bombing a volcano. In the early 1900s, the Oregon legislature established the state's 362 miles of shoreline a public highway. Thus, in November 1970, the problem of dealing with a weak, old, rotting 45-foot sperm whale fell to the Oregon Department of Highways. It had been so long since they had to deal with a beach whale, no one could remember the best way to handle it. So after burying it or cutting it up was both ruled out, the decision was made to blow it up. Because in the words of the lead engineer, dynamite has solved many problems in the past. As a crowd of almost 100 people watched from a distance, 20 cases of dynamite were placed under the whale. The goal? Blast the carcass into little pieces that would then be cleaned up by birds and crabs. But the half ton of dynamite did not vaporize the 8 ton beast, and instead large chunks of whale were sent high into the air and in the direction of the onlookers. While most of the audience found themselves soaked with disgusting red whale mist, Fortunately, there were no casualties, except for a 69 Oldsmobile that was completely destroyed by a three-foot piece of whale meat. Though a large portion of the whale still remained, and the smell lingered for days, the operation was considered a success, and the lead engineer received a promotion shortly thereafter. Despite this seeming disaster, taking care of whale problems with explosives continues to be a common method even today. Off the coast of Australia, dead whales sometimes become tourist attractions, with people even climbing on the carcasses for pictures, while sharks tear away at the body. To discourage this, authorities will use explosive charges to disperse the whale and speed up decomposition. And on a sadder note, when a whale becomes sick or injured, euthanization by way of explosives applied directly to the head or heart is considered the most humane way to put such a large animal out of its misery as quickly as possible. A Soviet program called Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy proposed the peaceful use of nukes to create artificial lakes, harbors, and canals. In January 1965, the experiments began with a 140 kiloton underground demolition in Kazakhstan, which displaced 10 million cubic meters of geological material and created a 400 meter wide artificial lake. Despite Soviet propaganda stating otherwise, the lake water ended up being heavily contaminated with radiation and remains hazardous down to this day earning it the name, the Atomic Lake. While the nuclear explosions for the national economy program included over 140 detonations between 1965 and 1989, the most interesting and successful ones weren't even part of the original plans. A natural gas well in southern Uzbekistan had been burning 12 million cubic meters of gas a day for three years, and all attempts to put it out had failed. Thus, in the autumn of 1966, a 30 kiloton nuclear bomb was lowered 1.4 kilometers into a borehole alongside the well, cemented over, and then detonated. It was, you could say, an explosive success, as the well was extinguished and the development of the gas field could finally resume. Over the next 15 years, this nuclear extinguishing method was used on four more out-of-control natural gas fires in USSR territories, with similar results. Now if you're hearing all this and thinking only in Russia would they try to improve their economy by nuking it, hold your stereotypes, because this whole program was actually inspired by an American initiative to explore the peaceful engineering uses of nuclear explosives. The nuclear explosion. He sees the potentials and he sees the problems. To investigate both and to develop the technology that will turn potentials into realities, the United States is conducting, for the benefit of all nations, a program it calls Plowshare. The U.S. program Operation Plowshare 
involved 27 separate tests, including three attempts at nuclear fracking on American soil. Warheads ranging from 30 to 40 kilotons were detonated one mile below the surface and actually succeeded in liberating large quantities of natural gas, though its radioactivity made it basically unsuitable for public use. Many of the other tests in Operation Plowshare were focused on excavation, with long-term proposals suggesting the possibility of widening the Panama Canal, creating an artificial harbor in Alaska, and an alternative to the Suez Canal blasted through Israel by way of 520 nuclear bombs. But by the late 70s, both public and congressional support for these projects waned, and Operation Plowshare was cancelled. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more weird history, I would like to encourage you to hit that subscribe button and check out some of my other content that is on your screen right now. Also, for those that want to become more involved in the channel, you will find Discord and Patreon links in the description and pinned comment below. My name is Sledge, thanks for watching.